If there is racism in Vermont, it is not the black woman who is bringing the racism into the state. It is our systems. It is our society. It is our failure to act. I shouldn't have been the only black woman serving in the legislature. There were only two women of color in the entire 180 person body. And I couldn't find anyone to replace me at this point in time. And that's just wrong. When it came time for re-election, that is when we started to see some of the uglier rhetoric that was really circulating around the nation. And so we're talking about 2016. It was during that crucial presidential election. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. And we found ourselves in the situation where I had become a target by some of the white nationalist groups here within the state. So there were vandalism acts that happened at our home. There was a break-in into our home in the middle of the night while we were sleeping. There were swastikas painted on the trees in the woods where I walk with my dog and my son. And all these things started building in this sort of aggregate and we went to law enforcement and the answer was, we're sorry. Sorry it's happening to you. Good, good luck. Um, take some safety courses. Get some cameras and extra security at your home. So I've known Kaya for a couple of years. We've worked in tandem on a couple of pieces of legislation. So we talked and had a decent relationship. And Kaya's dealt with so much in her life and so much since she's been here, especially as a black woman. You're already hyper visible just by existing here. So you're always on display and everything that you do is amplified. When you think of your elected officials, you think of these gatekeepers. And that's not how we are here. It's a very much an open government. You can literally walk into our state building with no real security checks of any sort. You don't even go through a metal detector. And you'll run into your electeds everywhere, at the grocery store, at your kid's soccer game, so many different places. And so there's this openness and vulnerability that heightens this level of danger. We were able to get some really small measures through the civil court system. The criminal justice system really wasn't able to do anything, bring any charges. I was seeing changes in my health. I was seeing changes in our community. I was seeing so many different things that were really weighing on me. And I knew that there was more work to be done, but it was always sort of weighing in my mind as to what will be the next step. And then the harassment began again this really dangerous confluence happened where a local individual who decided to run for office in a completely different district chose to use my face and my name as saying that I was the catalyst behind all of the gun legislation. Even though I didn't write the bills, I didn't sponsor the bills, I didn't even present the bills on the floor, I was one of 180 votes. But they chose to raise me up very specifically. And it was really sad and frightening because knowing that in those two years since when this harassment began, that using the Second Amendment argument became a pathway for people to get connected to these ideologies and these groups. So it starts with a thing like, aren't you so mad they're trying to ban bump stocks? To, don't you also hate the fact that these Mexicans are taking all of our jobs? And it created an entire community of individuals who were now engaging in this type of xenophobia and this really frightening rhetoric. And I still was not able to see how I would be able to be protected. And then we received a death threat. Um, this was a threat that my young son saw. And we brought it to our law enforcement 
and they sat on it for three weeks without turning it in for forensics. And it was at that point that I said, you know, I, it's just not going to be worth it for me to continue to do this when I don't see the protections that anyone deserves, let alone an elected official, but any individual, the dignity that people deserve to be able to do their jobs and not have to worry about what may come or who they may encounter. Haya is one of the toughest people I've ever met. It is unlike her to ask for help. She contacted me and was like, Tabitha, it's my son and it's my husband now. She said, it's one thing for me to be out there to do this. For them to threaten me, that's fine. But now they're coming at my family. As a parent, I can, that resonated with me. Like, that's, that's a line you don't cross. One of the things that's happened since she came out with it about not running was people saying, you know, she's just letting them win. No, they won because they were allowed to go for two years doing this to her. What are we doing as a system that they were allowed to do that? There's a difference between political dissent and hate, and she doesn't have to put up with hate. I think that my story has allowed for us to start asking really hard questions about who is at the table when we are looking for our elected officials to represent us and what are the barriers that they face, not only to running for office, but remaining within office. It's always the onus on the people of color to put our lives on the line for progress. Why do we keep having to put our bodies and our lives in mortal danger? for something that was supposed to have been resolved in the 60s, was supposed to have been resolved with the Emancipation Proclamation. In totality, it's a pretty enormous ask for anyone to say, you keep going forward, because if you don't, then they win. For me, I feel that I win because I chose to take my life back. I feel that I win because I'm taking a stand and I'm saying that this is not acceptable. The ways that we've been functioning the ways that our state government is functioning, it is not something that any of us should find comfort in. And so when I chose to do that, I win and we all win.